Welcome everyone to our second of three sessions on Black Jewish relations. I am Coach Kent Boyd, Executive Director of Love Akron, who will be your moderator for this evening's program. Tonight's program is about religion's role in Black Jewish relations. Please feel free during the program to post any questions in our Q&A box you will see at the bottom of the screen. We will do our best to get to all of your questions um, as many as possible, but you can also comment within the chat. We'll be going to about 8.15 this evening because we have a lot of great information that we'd like to cover and also like to present to you. Now, let me introduce our very, man, just honest and great panel of guests for this evening. Um, you should have received their full bio in the email for this evening's program. So let me introduce Rabbi Josh Brown, he has been the rabbi at Temple Israel since 2016. Pastor Darren Brake. Pastor Darren Brake is a lead pastor at House of the Lord Church in Akron, Ohio, under the leadership of the founding and preaching pastor, Bishop Joey Johnson. Rabbi Laura Lauren Werber is currently the rabbi at Temple Benan Abraham in Elyria, Ohio, and also she wrote a very powerful thesis statement that we're going to dig a little bit into this evening as well. And last but certainly not least is Pastor Herman Matheson. He is the Associate Pastor and Chief Operating Officer at House of the Lord. So good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Awesome. Good, good, good. So we're going to begin, and this is going to be a very you know, we want to come out the gate, right? This is, we got a lot of impactful and powerful information that we want to cover. So I'm going to come out the gate with a really strong question here. Um, it's one that's going to be probably highly provocative, and it's probably, we're probably going to get a lot of chats um, and a lot of questions about this. So I just want to ask out the gate, and I want to hear an answer from everybody. You can't avoid this. Um, it is 7.07. So let me ask you, have you had dinner yet? And if you have, what was it? Let's go, Pat, Pastor Darren Brake. Oh, yeah, I, I'm ready. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I did have dinner. Um, just finished it maybe about 10 or 15 minutes ago. <laughs> and um, I, I had a, um, a, a bacon um, cheeseburger, Big Mouth. Oh, burger. man. Um, from from Chili's. <laughs> Come on, I love it. I love it. Love I needed it, love I needed it. all the protein and carbs <laughs> I could get uh, to be ready for this this panel discussion. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Rabbi uh, Wer Rabbi Werber, what what about you? I wish we were more exciting. We did have dinner. We had breaded sole, breaded fish, and mashed potatoes and veggies. Oh man, that's good. That's that's a lot better than what. But Pastor Break hat. So, <laughs> kudos to you. Kudos to you. Kudos to you. Pastor Pastor Herman, what, what did did you already have dinner? And if you did, what'd you have? No, I haven't had dinner yet. I decided to, to fast before I did this, but at 816, I'm taking care of that. Come on now. I know that's right. I love it. Love it. Rabbi Brown, what about you? Well, uh my wife and I did the, uh, the the pizza handoff where she made the pizza. We sat down as a family for 15 minutes. We all ate our pizza. And right now, Netflix is babysitting my kids. And there's some chocolates that are waiting for them. If they do not interrupt us, they get the chocolates. So I can, you can be assured that we won't be interrupted. Hey, there you go, man. Great parenting tips for anybody that's out there. No judgment, Rabbi Brown. I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you. Um, so again, thank you all for your time, for being with us. It, it is dinner time, but at the same time, we're gonna we're gonna feast on this discussion and conversation on this evening. And I do want to come out with a very serious question that I want to ask each and every one of you. And, and I'm gonna start with you, Pastor um, Herman Matherson. Is can you tell our audience your why? And when I'm saying your why, I'm meaning why are you here? Why is this important for you to be a part of this panel? Uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, for me, it's, personally, it's unfinished business. And when I say unfinished business, where I grew up is a very vibrant civil rights town. And the Jewish community did reach out to us. And particularly when I was in high school, I wasn't focused on that. We had our own issues going on. Uh, secondarily, I'd like to be a part of acknowledging that the relationship 
between the African-American community and the Jewish community does need to be rekindled. There's a legacy there that is important that I, th I think needs to be rekindled. Mm, love that. Unfinished business. Love it, love it, love it. Um, Rabbi Brown, same question. Uh, so um, there are a lot of reasons. I I'll uh, a, brief, uh, a brief story that stayed with me from a colleague uh, in Ferguson, uh, Missouri, who shared that um, when that community uh, was really suffering from, uh, when, when they were marching in the streets in Ferguson, he reached out to a, a, a leading black minister and said, we want to march with you. And the response he got uh, was, you know, we wish you would have been here years ago. Uh, so I, I, think, I think that was a really honest response that we can't only show up in the moments of crisis, that we need to be together around tables and in discussion so that when the moments of crisis hit, we're not introducing ourselves to each other. Um, and I think this is our, uh, even though there are moments of crisis going on, that, that this is a chance to do that. Uh, so I, that's what I'm looking forward to. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Pat, Pastor Dan Briggs, same question. What's your why? I'll give you, I can give you two. Um, one would be that this was a, a, a relationship that I knew from kind of a peripheral perspective that it existed um, at some point in time, just in my reading and being aware of, of Dr. King to a point. But I, I felt like I needed to know more because I felt like this was important um, and that I needed to dive in completely um, in this because it's important, but also for as a learning experience for myself, but then also for the opportunity to build, um, to build new relationships. Um, and, you know, out of this came the amazing opportunity to, to, to participate in Rabbi uh, Josh's Shabbat service, which was something that wouldn't have happened. Um, and I really just, that, that was a high honor for me just to be able to participate in something like that and begin to kind of start a, uh, a friendship as a, as a part of this. Okay. And Rabbi Werber, same. And, and you, you're probably a little bit more prepared because you actually wrote a thesis statement that I think may even play a role into your answer right now. I guess, it, I guess that's what I could add since you brought it up because everybody <laughs> said so much. Um, my rabbinical thesis was uh, because you, I guess I have to tell people now, my rabbinical <laughs> thesis was on Southern rabbis preaching on civil rights in the 1950s and 1960s. And um, the sort of common wisdom is that Southerners were very quiet in their support, Southern Jews of the civil rights movement, but the reality was these rabbis risked their lives and their families' lives and the safety of their buildings to speak up in cities all across the South. Um, and it's a reminder to me that we have that same obligation and that we have a very, very hard one and deep relationship with one another. Um, it, it's sad to realize that we don't always in either of our communities realize the kinship that we have. Uh, that's a both uh, natural and in a spiritual sense, a natural kinship and a very powerful practical kinship. So if we wanna to work toward a more just world, which is really the purpose of our faiths, then the way to do that is to rekindle this relationship in the best ways we can. Mm. Appreciate the, the honesty and, and just your, everybody's transparency in the answer because there's a common thread and a common theme of us being relational and really digging into the relationships. And we know that relationships are not, um, a lot of times we hear that word relationship and we think it's a very simple answer, almost a throwaway answer, but really relationships are very um, complex and complicated, right? Um, just ask anybody that's married, right? It, it's, it's a very complex um, thing. However, you know, as, as we move forward and I know we're gonna get to kind of where do we go from here and what do we want to do? I want to take a moment to step back in reflection um, to June of 2020, right? And kind of the, you know, Pastor Darren Break, you know, kind of the, you know, what was it like for you the days after the murder of George Floyd? What, what, what was that like for you being an African-American male, first off? What, what was that like for you? Like it, you're wearing two roles, right? You're African-American male, but also you're, 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 you're a pastor who shepherds a group of people. So what was that day? What were days after? What was that like for you? It was interesting um, <clears throat> for a couple of different reasons. One, um, it was times filled with a lot of sadness, um, having to explain it. 
um, and have conversations with my 17 year old boy about it, um, as well as my, uh, at the time he was seven, uh, my seven year old uh, about what was going on. And it was that, that parental aspect of it. Um, it was another aspect of, you know, maybe now, um, maybe this might be uh, the way that, that people will start paying attention um, to what we've been saying for a long time. Since at that moment, you know, summertime quarantine, COVID numbers are, you know, spiking in many places that people are kind of forced to have to pay attention. Mm -hmm. And it almost seemed like it was a, a perfect storm. And at the same time, I had to, in the midst of my own, you know, anger, uh, it's kind of funny how things work. I was also getting some calls from uh, from some uh, white clergy uh, wanting to start to have some conversations and some dialogue um, and wanting to figure out, you know, we haven't done, we haven't played a part up until this point and shame on us for that. But what can, what can we do? How can we start having a relationship from this point forward? So there was a, there was a lot of different conflicting um, feelings and emotions going on at that time for me. Yeah. Thinking about, you know, on the, on the flip side, right? Because that's, if you will, yeah, that was a national tragedy, but obviously it hit us a little bit harder within the black community, right? Mm -hmm. And so let me go to the other side um, and talk to you, Rabbi Werber, about the bombings that took place in Pittsburgh at that synagogue. What, what was that like? Because what, what I'm going to come back and do and be ready, um, Rabbi Brown and Rabbi Matheson, because you're going to talk about how you saw, Rabbi Matheson, you're going to talk about how you saw the Pittsburgh bombing being an African-American, right? And what effect that played on you? Because, hey, man, you're not Jewish. And technically, that's not your synagogue, right? So we're going to come back to that. But um, Rabbi Werber, tell us about the Pittsburgh bombing and, and how you felt days after that. Days after was interesting um, because that was after we had some time to um, regroup as a community and feel the love of the community around us. Uh, before I say that, I'll say we were at a congregational lunch as we heard about it. So that moment was a very different moment of confusion, of debating whether to announce at a social event or not what had happened, of you know um, coming to terms with it in that moment. In the days that followed, um, what what I found interesting is the the tension between those who were very fearful and those who said everything needs to go on. And, and we made the decision, as many synagogues did, to hold our Shabbat services the next week. Um, and we didn't publicize much, but we opened our doors to the community. We're a 45 member congregation and we had over 300 people um, from the community, from all faiths joining us and, and built relationships that have lasted until now. So it turned into this moment of empowerment and relationship building that we never expected. At the same time, as all of a sudden, um, we weren't just trying to be empathetic with other communities who faced violence and fear, and we were suddenly one of those communities again. And that was uh, sort of a rude awakening for us, I would say. Mm. Yeah. Pastor Herman Matheson. The Pittsburgh bombings. How did that affect you? Well, one of the one of the things that helped me put it in a context was thinking about the four little girls that got killed in the church that was bombed in the south. Um, just reflecting on that, and I wasn't there, wasn't really of age, but I I've read a lot about that, so I understand, have somewhat of an understanding of what the community felt like, and they could not go on. It was not business as usual as probably never has been since that since that point in time. So I, I, I could relate to that. So it gave me a sense of sadness and pain for the tears of those family members, for the victims, and for anybody that watched that and could, re and could, re and could relate to that. And at the same time, I got angry because here we go again. It just wasn't in my community this time. But yet again, it happened in a community of a, of a, of a, a, a different ethnic community. And that is pain. That is painful as well. And uh, frankly, Coach, um, the bombing took me to a dark place in my past, where I felt about certain things were going on in my community of that kind of nature um, that I won't speak on right now.
but it took it took me back to darkly and I had to I had to, I had to snap myself back out of that. Mm. Man, thank you for that. And, and we may dig a little deeper into that now. Come on, you just gave me something to put out there, so I'm on, I'm gonna come back to that. Man, be ready. Uh, come on, I will be. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbi Brown, what was it like for you days after the murder of George Floyd? Uh. You know, I so I'll, I'll do a confession here. Uh, I, I still have not watched the video. Uh, I have not been able to watch the video, I would say. of uh, I know what happens in the video, and I've seen clips of the video. I haven't watched the video. Uh, I, think, um, I think beyond the emotions that I think were typical, I was hoping that because there was such a clear video of the entire incident, that this would be a moment that wouldn't be debated like so many other moments had been debated. Uh, but I'll tell you that I want to say one more piece that I about it that was an experience for me, uh, which was, uh, I, so I think, I, think I, I would say I experienced it as an outsider looking in for sure. Uh, that I was hoping it would cause change, much like Pastor Brake said. I was hoping that the fact that it was recorded and that that video was able to be seen would convince people that there was only one way to look at this. Um, but I didn't really get it until uh, until I sat down one night over the summer and uh, turned on uh, Dave Chappelle uh, doing stand up what I thought was stand up uh, <laughs> because I wanted something funny to laugh at in our world. And he instead spoke about his experience watching those eight minutes and what that meant to him to to hear a black man talk bluntly about what it felt like for him to watch that uh was uh very uh eye-opening and that was that was when for me i think i was really the most um impacted uh by george floyd's murder uh was to know the ripple effects of how it personally tore people apart knowing um, that that was going to impact their personal lives um, in ways that it didn't impact mine. That, that was maybe my maybe that was my first moment of realizing what the difference is um, between myself and Pastor Matherson and and Pastor Brake, uh, looking at a man uh, who very well could be in their community in their pews, and me not thinking that way, um, and separating just a little bit uh, or a lot at times from it. Um, but hearing somebody talk about it and be passionate about it and explain how it impacted them uh, and humanize it that way was, uh, was it really was a, had a huge impact on me. Thank you. Um, Rabbi Warb, I want to ask you a question here. Why is it a thing? And do you believe it's a thing that people who look like you? Why is why is the discussion of race so uncomfortable? Do you believe it's uncomfortable? I do believe it's uncomfortable for a lot of people. Um, it's interesting because I'm fairly outspoken. If I'm speaking to an African-American, I'll just ask a question or acknowledge your blackness. Mm. Um, and some of my peers question if that's impolite because there's a sense, right? If you're my age, you grew up in the age of colorblindness and melting pot. So noticing is somehow um, inconsiderate, where my perspective is that respectfully noticing is acknowledging someone's being, right? Absolutely. But, so, so people don't mean harm, but they don't want to overstep bounds, perhaps, and, and be offensive. Um, and, and I can speak more personally. I don't want to put words in other people's mouths. Sometimes we don't know what to do, right? Yeah. So um, we see the enormity of a problem in, in the world and we don't know how to fix it. And we know that uh, people who look like us have created the problem and that we aren't, if, if we're honest with ourselves, we aren't, at, at best, we aren't enough of the solution. And just a little more honest, maybe we're just a little bit of the problem um, yeah. or certainly those close to us are. So it's hard to reckon with that. Um, and I think it's just intimidation with the enormity of what we need to do and accomplish rather than that sense of, um, you know, faith is taking the first step. 
yeah. right? And, and instead of saying, I'm going to take a step, I'm going to talk to one person who's not like me. I'm going to ask one question. I'm going to do one thing. Uh, we can get really uncomfortable with, with the size of the problem and with what we don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to go back to you right now, Pastor Master, because because Rabbi Werber said something that I that, that I know if I say this to my wife, Stacy, I'm going to be sleeping on the couch. <laughs> but if I come to her saying, hey, I want to fix this for you. Right. Is, is that is that something you as as a black man, do you want white people to fix something for you? Just curious. Oh, God, no. <laughs> the part the, 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 the part of the problem is and I, I want to pick up what. Rabbi Lauren left off. The problem is perceived or, or real authenticity. Are you coming to me to talk about racism so that you feel better <laughs> with little regard of how I feel when I'm trying to explain to you who I am? Further, I don't need you to be colorblind. I need you to see the color that I am mm -hmm. and, and, and acknowledge that. So I'm the, the, the blindness thing for me is kind of a misnomer in a sense that no, you need to see who I am uh, for what I am. Yeah. And that the fixing, if there is a fix, is going to be in the depth of authentic conversation about it, that you ask the tough question, you ask the raw question, you, you make it uncomfortable. Um, you, make it, you may even make it painful. If you want, if one has, and then we all have to reflect on ourselves and how we dealt with one another. So it's, it's there to, to fix it. It means that there's a recipe yeah. and to do this, 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 and then that will happen. And that is, that's, we don't even live like that. Mm. Um, would, so, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. But I would add to that. Um, and I should have said that to start with one of the reasons that I struggle is, and one of the reasons that it's not that the relationship was perfect and now it fell apart and it doesn't exist. There were, there was good and bad in the past. There's good and bad now. Sure. But one of the things that caused tension was some members of the Jewish community taking or wanting to take leadership roles in civil rights issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, the need for us as white people, and especially more so now as Jews, I think even than then, uh, because we're more white now than we were perceived to be then. Uh, we need to take the cues from you. And, and so we need to be marching if you want us marching, but marching behind you, not in front of you, mm. right? So, so you can't fix it alone because really it's not your problem. It's a white problem, right? Racism is a white problem. It's not a black problem. So we have to be in there working, but we're not, we're not in the lead. We're, we're the ones that need to take the cue and listen to you and understand what you're trying to tell us. And that that's hard for people to do. That's an uncomfortable place to be. Yeah. I, I, like <laughs> this is good because I've, I've heard that um, racism is a sin problem, but I ain't heard racism is a white problem. Like I, I like that. Like I'm <laughs> sign me up for that. Like I'm, I'm for being a white problem. It is <laughs> right by words for saying that. Um, so with that being said, you know, uh, Pastor Darren Brake, it is there out there because I think a little bit about what Pastor what Pastor Masson was saying and also Rabbi Werber was saying. Is there a white savior complex right now that we're living in? Um, I would say absolutely. Um, I, I, I view it more as a paternal perspective, um, mm -hmm. where it's almost like I know better than you or I know what you need. And you actually see that all across, um, even in how charity is done, not just even in race, but even how charity is done, um, in particular in our context, of not of a sitting with, um, let me experience life in your shoes, let me experience life with you, let me get to know you, um, but more of a coming in, and, okay, do this or do that, and do this or do that. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say that is, um, that is prevalent. Mm. Um, Rabbi Brown, you you invited Pastor Darren to do um, this Shabbat service with you. I want to say it's about a couple of weeks ago now. Um, how was that received by your synagogue, by your congregants? Uh, well, it's it's uh, it's it's always exciting to have uh, a guest. I, I mean, I think I, 
first of all, our, our congregants get tired of our faces and our voices. So no matter what, they were going to love Pastor Break. Uh, <laughs> But so, so he, he, it, it, it's, and it's always good to be a guest pastor that way. But, um, but I think that, that that would be the case with if it was anyone. I think that this is uh, right now, um, our community uh, is thirsty for this conversation. Um, and I don't know that we know how to have it. I, I and I, I think that's a global we. I don't think any of us know exactly how to have the conversation. I think we're just, we're just jumping in and saying we're going to try, um, and we're going to. Tr and by trying, we hope we will have progress somewhere. Um, and I, I think that that's the feeling. I've heard that from so many people, especially after George Floyd. Uh, I think that that may have been the um, the the moment where uh, people who had been thinking about it for a long time finally opened up their mouths and said, "No, now." I've been thinking about this and not saying anything for, for too long. Now I've got to say something and I want to do something, but I don't know. We, we heard from so many people. Uh, I don't know what to do. I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. Um, and so to have uh, pastor break sit in our sanctuary virtually uh, and to, to, to by that, by doing that uh, as we are tonight to come into our homes, I think it was in some ways uh prayers being answered for a lot of people uh, that this is how we can start doing this, uh, that it doesn't have to be um, impossible. It, it means reaching out to people who live right in our city, who, who in lots of ways are just like us and, and have values like ours and have lives like ours. Uh, it, we don't have to reach across the country. Um, we, we have this in our own community and we can do that uh, in places like our own homes and our own synagogues and churches. Um, and so I, I think that there was a huge sigh of relief that we finally got to do something we've been waiting to do. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to come back to you, Pastor Masterson, because I don't want to let this go, um, because we are in uh, an atmosphere where we are relationship building. And so um, culturally, I'm from the South. And so, yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am was a part of my vocabulary. And so when I hear you say something took you to a dark place because of what it triggered, and, and these are more of mental health type of terms, right? Things trigger us because there's trauma and then there's secondhand trauma. So I, I want to kind of give you, if you will, the platform. I want you to speak into that a little bit for our panelists, but also for our audience that is listening. I, I want them to be able to hear because um, I, I'm not going to say that you're older, but you're an elder. And so with that being said, your experiences haven't been mine, but I think as a black man, knowing that this is Black History Month, I need to hear from my elder about where some of these things took you mentally, but also what, what it triggered in your past experiences. Well, I'm from the South as well. And, uh, and where I'm from, there was, a, there was a lot of violence. A lot of violence. I, I, remember, I, can, I remember the National Guard coming down the street with tanks and shooting into the dormitories of the HBCU that is there. I saw people, I saw people killed. Um, I saw man's inhumanity to man. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that festered in me, that grew into me in, to an anger that I, I don't think I can adequately describe, but it was a possessive anger. And it was actually an anger that I, for a while that I actually nurtured. Um, uh, and it wasn't, be, and it wasn't because I didn't have. I had some wonderful teachers that were white. I had some that sent me on a career, but when I saw those kind of things, I, it became I became very jaded. And when I saw the when I saw the Pittsburgh bombing, when I saw the George Floyd and all the other incidences, um, the fear in me, the fear of my the fear I felt was primarily for my sons, who I could not put my hands on at the time. They live out of state. And that took me, said, it took me to an if then, if that was them, what would I do? Mm. And that trail is very, that trail was very dark. And I remember having been there and only because I remembered it was I able to snap out of it um, because then I, could, I, would, I was very, um, 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 what would I call it? I was very, like I said, jaded 
And the, parad <laughs> the paradox was, and my dad would laugh at me for a while because I was like that. I went to a primarily white university. And when I told him, he said, really? <laughs> That's where you're gonna go? I said, they gave me money. <laughs> it, it was, I didn't have to pray about it. It wasn't the dynamic spiritualized way, he gave me money. So the dark the darkness was, and I learned a lot, I learned a lot while I, while I was in college and dealing with um uh with other ethnicities. And that's where I began to regret not engaging the Jewish community where I grew up, because I did do that in college. Mm. And I felt like I missed I missed something in our God. So that's a piece of my unfin unfinished business. But the darkness, the darkness was an anger and a rage. That it that it that it took me to, and um, it sometimes just I scare myself mm. because what 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 pray tell am I going to do with that? But for the grace of God, yeah. Thank you for that. And again, I know I'm supposed to be moderating and doing all this stuff, but anybody you know, whether it's you, Pastor Darren, you Rabbi Brown, or you Rabbi Werber, hearing that, what what can you speak in? Do you have any questions? for Pastor Matthew in that regard, because, hey, this is us, about us building relationships with one another. Yeah, we got an audience that's listening, but we have to show the example <coughs> of relationship, and to your point, um, Rabbi Werber, of how to lean into these discussions and conversations. So I, I, want, I want us to lean into that with Pastor Matthew, and I saw you, Rabbi Brown, kind of unmute yourself, so lean in, brother. So I, I'm going to I want to hit on some of what we've you've, you've already asked, but it, it strikes me that the hardest moment for me after uh, the murders in Pittsburgh was uh, walking with my about a month later, I want to say uh, I was walking with my kids um, and we were somewhere in public and there was a little TV screen and the news was playing and it was showing the synagogue being shot up. Mm. Uh, and I had to take them out of the room because I didn't want them to see that. Uh, and I think for me, the reason I want to bring that moment up is I think what I've started to feel after George Floyd and all these other images, have uh, they're always in the news. So that was one image. I didn't want my Jewish kids seeing a synagogue. We have such a hard time just selling the idea that a synagogue belongs in America when there's a church on every corner and, and trying to let them have a Jewish identity that's positive. I didn't want them to see a synagogue being shot at and people being murdered in a place that we've tried to get them to love. So I don't know how it must feel on a regular basis to raise black children uh, when there are images all the time that say, it's dangerous to be black, that you don't get that, that it's not safe. I, I really don't, uh, that is not something that naturally comes to me until I think I was able to see my own, uh, try, to, try to protect my own children from this one incident, which was terrible. But then I look back and I think it, there's been one, uh, you know, a handful of terrible anti-Semitic attacks especially over the last few years. Uh, but how often do we look on TV and hear about yet another uh, black man? Uh, and that image is up for weeks uh, that, that if it was my children, I don't know if I'd be covering their eyes from seeing the news. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think I, that's one of my, my questions is, is, you know, I don't know how often that image comes up or that, that, that knee jerk reaction. Uh, and and just so I'm not talking the whole time, I'll say the thing, the other piece is I, I've become very conscious of being a white man in the last year, more than I've ever been in it. And re, especially wearing a mask where I can't smile at someone else. So my, my flip of that is I would love to know from uh, from everyone. Uh, but I I realize that I sometimes might look like the aggressor for the first for the first time in my life. I'm realizing that if if I'm wearing jeans and a ratty T-shirt and and a dirty hat uh, and I'm driving my SUV, uh, I might look like somebody uh, that you may have seen on TV that was trying to tear down the Capitol. Uh, and and I've never had that feeling either. 
uh, until these la this last year of being a dangerous white man. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I'm just saying, I don't know how it, I'm just starting to learn what it feels like uh, to have some of those feelings uh, now in my life. It's, it's interesting because, you know, part of it in hearing Pastor uh, Matheson talk, there's the aspect that's like, you know, how long, you know, how long will uh, we continue to um, have to be in the same space? And, and even for me, it's, even, it's almost even to the opposite because I need my children to see those images. I need my children to understand that, um, as W.E.B. Du Bois says, that there's a double consciousness that you have to have. Um, as, as, a, as a Black man um, in America, you have to not only be aware of, you have to stay aware of it because that may cost you your life if you don't, but then you also have to be aware of how that may how that may make other people feel and how you may have to do other things above and beyond just to make other people feel comfortable um, in the same space with you. Yeah. Um, so it's a completely different because, especially for me, I have three sons, um, you know, they're and they're all over. They're 17, <clears throat> eight and 13 months. And, you know, and I have to approach all of them with that. They need to be aware of that. So as a, as a father raising boys in America, where even just um, being a black male is considered a weapon, <laughs> um, they need to understand that. But you have to do it in a way that you have to always kind of keep love in there because you, you can, there's a balance, like you can go too far um, in that. So you have to make them be aware, but you have to kind of even couch that in love and, 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 and values that uh, are above what uh, society is trying to place on them, if that makes sense. Um, I first wanna thank both of you for speaking so honestly with us, um, Pastor Matherson. It's hard to speak about anger and rage, I think. I, I can't say it for you, I can say it for me. It's hard to open up about those things and I appreciate you doing that. Um, I knew what I wanted to say. And then Pastor Break, you brought up this how long and it just brought me back to the 50s and 60s to these sermons I studied. And these rabbis are sitting in their Southern towns and they're preaching and saying, people want us, are, are promoting gradualness and gradualness is a sin when this has been going on for so long. We can't be gradual anymore. This has to change. And to think that that was said 50, 60 years ago is heartbreaking that that long ago in conservative towns in the South, people said it's been too long and we haven't figured this out. Um, but the other, the, that's not even what I wanted to talk about, but it, it was just, it, it's so upsetting when I, when we think, when I think about that. Um, one of my college professors spoke to my congregation recently, who was a favorite professor, and he wrote a book on unsettling empathy. He said, it's, he, he does work, um, in trauma and reconciliation. And he said, empathy is not enough. It has to unsettle us. So um, unsettling empathy means we listen to Rabbi Brown talk about being a white man. And if, if you're African-American, you say, oh, I can relate to that discomfort, even though it's the complete opposite side of the coin. And we listen to Pastor Matherson talk about this rage and we say, we're uncomfortable as white people um, being a part of that story, but we can relate to the rage. And, and we have to go into those places if we want to make progress. Um, one more quick thing is uh, there was recently an article in the uh, forward in a database of monuments, statues in the, all over the world that are statues to Nazi collaborators. And two of these statues are located within a few miles, a few minutes of my synagogue. So the person who wrote the article asked if I or someone in the congregation would go and photograph these monuments to, not, to a Nazi collaborator. And my husband and I went and did this for him. I was not prepared for my reaction. And the, 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 the sadness, the, the anger, uh, the sense of injustice that this was standing there, the questions I had about 
they're outside of churches, why churches would keep these standing and do they know what it is and what does that mean they think of me? And I had this moment of, you know, obviously thinking about these civil war monuments in our country that, that these poor black college students are walking by to go to their classes. And, and, and that's the unsettling empathy, right? It's, it's not just, yeah, civil war statues cause pain to people. It's I'm gonna in some way feel that pain and then understand and build our relationship on that, on that in part and be committed to dissipating the anger and the fear and the rage and all that's around us because in some way we can relate. Um, and, and I think that's when, when I hear you speak of anger and rage, it's trying to get at um, where am I a source? <laughs> Right? How do I correct where I'm a source, and how do I just sit with that with with somebody else, and, and acknowledge the pain that that is sometimes shared and sometimes not? Man, this is so much meat to this, and thank you all for your truth, and speaking your truth where you are. That's so important. Um, I want to encourage our audience. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q and A box down below. And I want to I want to read a question that that came in. It's and it's addressed to the rabbis. So I want to read it. it says, um, how do the rabbis see the insurrection um, that took place? Meaning a Black Lives Matter protest would have had all would have had police all over the place and would have never gotten that close to the Capitol. So I'm going to I'm going to start with you, Rabbi Brown, with that question. Uh, I continue to ask myself uh, how and who le did not, uh, the, the, I think a lot of people said, I know, I know I repeated it from other people saying it, uh, we were shocked that day, but we were not surprised. Mm. There, there was no excuse uh, not to have uh, the Capitol protected and the people uh, arrested on the spot because we all knew it was coming. Uh, so I want to know, what I keep asking myself is, so who who was in the room making decisions in the days leading up to that? And who was right there at the fence letting this escalate um, seemingly without any response? Um, and, and part of me is cynical about that, I guess. And, and I hope that my cynicism isn't correct, but my, the, the cynical side of me says it was people who sympathized with the people who were there and felt that it was okay for Pete, that, that they saw this as an expression of people's rights to protest the government and that this was somehow okay. And that when they see that coming from someone that they don't see uh, who looks like themselves, I don't want to just say uh, of color, but because because I think today it, it's also politics. When they see somebody carrying a flag that they disagree with, uh, meaning a Black Lives Matter flag or, a, you know, a, some sort of allegiance to a, a, a cause that they disagree with, um, I think that 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 is what is has become our unfortunate litmus test, um, and I want to know who and why uh, that was what happened that day, instead of uh, instead of upholding the the values and the the Constitution and the sense of being an American uh, for everyone, uh, and and I just I I'm still dumbfounded by it. Uh, and and the but I'll, I'll hold out this one piece of hope is that that I have from it is that um, you know I, I hope that that people continue to get prosecuted in a serious way uh, and that we and that that is as public as the destruction that they did that we see that people from videos on cell phones and and I hope that we get to see that even if the justice takes months or years to happen that that justice somehow uh, does come out of this. Um, and, and yeah, I, I think it's uh, my short answer after my long answer now would be, it's just, it's just unjust. The, the, the comparison between that and these other marches that we've had 
Uh, we all know the examples. Um, it's absurd. Uh, and I know we have felt that as Jews at times, especially regarding Israel. That's a common concern that we have is that Israel is treated different than other countries. Uh, and, and I think that it was, it was just to try and relate our stories in some ways, that that was also a response that I think we came out of this saying, this is so clearly a different response to such a more violent act than we've seen in other parts of our country when there were peaceful protests and people were arrested immediately or beaten. Um, that it was just clear, uh, clearly unjust, unfair, and I don't know, I wanna know who and why. Thank you. Rabbi Werber, do you have anything to add? Um, well said, <laughs> I'll add just a little bit. Um, my first response was anger and I think, yeah, surprised, but not shocked. Um, but it switched to heartbreak pretty quickly. And um, because I am very aware of white privilege. I, I'm very aware, I thought, of white privilege, of systemic racism. I would never deny these things. I um, say it's going on. I try to be an ally in any way I can. And then when, when the insurrection occurred and it was a thousand times more in our face <laughs> than I had wanted to see, it was like the, the deepest level of, of seeing that privilege and seeing systemic racism and seeing just individual racism. You know, it, so, so it was just heartbreaking to see. Um, there was an interview on NPR in This American Life with a black Capitol Police officer and I think that's when it really um, hit me. I was riding my bike and listening. And um, it, it, how in danger this man's life was because he was a black man. And the things that were said to him as he was doing his job, uh, which uh, not everybody was doing that day, um, were heartbreaking. And, and I think the, the only um, positive of it, and certainly not a worthwhile positive, is how many people could no longer deny this, yeah. right? That it was so clear and so in our faces that this double standard is even more extreme than we could have imagined. Absolutely. This next question is for the pastors, um, Pastor Matheson and Pastor Brake. How do you find and experience love in this country that has been treating black people so poorly for so long. And that is understandably so painful for you personally, personally. Can you read that one more time? Yes. How do you find and experience love in this country that has been treating black people so poorly for so long? I'll jump out there. I think it comes in the um, in these islands of hope experiences. Um, it comes in a lot of the one-off experiences where um, there is love felt at an individual level um, when interacting with someone that isn't like me. Um, it is not is is the different in terms of a systemic interaction, but I do find that in in these one-off um, islands of hope, in these one-off interactions with people who are authentic um, and 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 transparent and interact and loving interacting with me. You you mute yep. Yeah. I thought you were gonna keep preaching. <laughs> <laughs> One of the first places for me is I have to remember and, and this is what takes me slams me back to God's reality is how God accepted me and how how ugly I was at the time. Mm. And when I when I look at that and I look, and I look at others, um, I find love. I'm, and I'm with Pastor Darren, is I try to give people a chance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a perfect try, but is 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 it authentic? And those are for me, those are the islands of hope that uh, Pastor Darren just just alluded to, is to one still be willing to engage people and to give them a chance. Um, to know what's personal and, and is not personal for me because every issue is not mine it, it has may not have anything to do with me but is my re, is my reflection 
on how God accepted me. And that is my ground, that's my groundwork for giving people, giving people a chance. And I have, there have been some rough times, some very painful times, but the times, the joyous times for the relationships I do have with people of a different culture far outweigh that. Mm. And that's what continues to give me hope to give the next person a chance yeah. with the with 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 the engagement. Yeah. And I would even add that sometimes the the feeling of feeling love is actually the feeling you get of giving love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's good. Keep keep your keep keep yourselves unmuted because I, I want to ask this question before we go over and we take some more uh, people's questions as they come in. But this was said, I believe, by you, uh, Pastor Matheson, but also you, Rabbi Werber. And one of the comments was how this person says, man, it aggravates me when people say they don't see color. Like that is so aggravating. So why is it important? Why is it important for all of us to see color? Why is that so important? And I'm going to go first to you, Pastor Matheson. It's a part of our humanity. And one of the great, one of the the, the, the biggest um, one of the things that slavery did is it tried to strip us of our humanity. Mm. That we were not human. So my being an African American is part of my humanity. As God create as God created me. Mm. So that becomes very difficult because the, the statement is much deeper than just I don't see color. I ask, do you do you even see me, period? And then do I matter? Do I matter? Yeah. Yeah. Rabbi Werber, I know you were touching on this at the beginning when you kind of talked about your why, why you're here. And you you kind of brought, you didn't say the word, so I'm kind of saying it, but to surmise it, it was this humanizing us as one another. You know, it humanizes us a little bit when we can kind of see ourselves in each other, right? A, a little bit. Yes, but I, but I wasn't saying what I would, let me clarify first. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I was saying is when I was growing up, so, you know, the mm -hmm. 80s in school, in a well-integrated school, that was the time we were hearing colorblindness and melting yeah. pot. I wasn't advocating that in any way. I'm no, 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 no. What I'm saying is that that creates a world where for some um being colorblind is seen as the way to acceptance. And what Pastor Matherson said is, is so important in countering that, right? So then they tried the salad bowl and who knows what we're up to instead of the melting pot now. <laughs> but keep coming up with different things to be, right? Um, so, so the challenge is, yes, how do I see aspects of my experience and my historical experience in anyone who is other and at the same time, how do I acknowledge the very different experience and very different history and um, not compare tragedies, right? Not compete, not have competitive uh, misery, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. and, and not say, I mean, so, so there's a truth. These, these freedom satyrs, for example, that some, that some of us do. I know Akron does a great one. We've done it um, with, with a church, an African-American church where we compare our stories of slavery and redemption and, and say how we're alike. It's a very powerful experience, but they are not equal. So our mythical story of being slaves in Egypt thousands of years ago is not the same as your lived experience of having a great grandparent who was a slave and living the racism that has followed in your own lives. They're not the same story. So yes, we should see ourselves and our common humanity and the notion that we're all created in the image of God and we're all one when I, when I look into any of your faces. But at the same time, we have to honor that these are not identical stories, not just for, for Blacks and Jews, for any two people, for any yeah. two groups, um, and, and meet people where they are in their struggles and in, in their lived reality. Yeah. And so, and good, I wasn't saying that you was advocating for it. I know that's what you grew up with in the 80s. Um, however, I, I heard someone tell me this two months ago, that they don't see color. And this is 20, 2020. And somebody said, I oh, I don't see color. Them. Yeah, yeah. And, and they said, I don't see color. And, and, I, and I believe I understand. It, and it goes back to intention versus impact, right? I think I understand that their intention, but their impact was is also, you're not seeing me. 
and you're not seeing of all of who I am. So I have one more question for all the panelists before I, I turn it over to my friend, um, Kathy Bayer. It says, how have these conversations changed your perspective or deepened your understanding on black Jewish relations? And I'm gonna start with you, Rabbi Brown. Uh, <clears throat> First, it's um, it's uh, it's good just to have something to do together. I think that the value of being in a room together, I, of somebody recently said, I don't remember who, somebody recently said, just the value of showing up. Um, there is value in just being in the same space, and I think especially today we can't take that for granted, not just, not because of COVID, but because uh, we we aren't finding ourselves in the same spaces enough. Um, and, and so I would say just by being in the same virtual room, that's been, uh, that's been eye-opening to me. Uh, but what, what to, to give that a little more uh, flavor, I would say hearing each other's stories, um, and, and, I, and I don't mean to contradict at all what Rabbi Werber is saying. I think we, our stories are different. And yet I relate to them in the ways that they are the same. Like, it, so... So I'm not saying that they're that we equate them, but I know what it feels like when my identity as a Jewish person is not seen by other people. I'm not saying that I know what it feels like when somebody says that they don't see color. I, I, I don't want to equate the two, but I can sympathize in a way because I know what it feels like when I've had to try to explain that my identity as a Jewish person is something that should be noticed. I have to, I have to do that sometimes. And, and so when I hear a story uh, in one of our discussions, uh, Pastor Brake had, had told, a, I'm not going to tell his story, but he had told a, a, a simple comment about his mom calling him worried about something. And I know what that feels like. Uh, so I may not know what it feels like around the same issues, um, but I can, it opens my eyes up. Um, and I just, I think uh, one of the, um, one of the lessons that I, I hold tightly to from uh, rabbinical school is uh, try to uh, seek to understand more than you seek to be understood. Uh, and, and I just think uh, the more we can hear each other's stories, which is something Pastor Matherson uh, raised up in our early discussions that, this should be about, uh, this should not be a, a theological lesson. This should be a story lesson about our own stories and who we are as people. I think the more we learn about that, the more theological we get um, because we really, we start to see ourselves uh, connected to other people. And once we do that, uh, I think we know what to do without being told. So I think, I think that happens. And, and that's been one of the great, great things about being in the room together. Pastor Break, same same question. I want to add okay. this this caveat at the end. Okay. What steps should we take beyond this conversation? Okay. The first question is I'll deal with is I, I will go you know kind of piggyback on uh, Rabbi Josh's comment about just being in the room, um, about experiencing how uh, passionate Kathy is about pulling all this together, um, sitting in a room and hearing. Um, how, how, um, what's the word I'm looking for? How, um, how quick and intelligent uh, Rabbi Werber's comments are and how she picks up on details of comments that are said and she has a way of articulating things it's like, oh, wow, that is really good. You know what I mean? Or mm -hmm. when me and Rabbi Josh and we got on a Zoom and we were planning the, uh, the Shabbat service and just the, the, the 20 minutes that we just talked about uh, being, you know, leading congregations and being in similar spaces in life. And, um, you know, certain times of the day, you don't have meetings uh, because then you're in debt to your wife because uh, you've encroached on <laughs> and all those kind of, and just those have been, you know, really the valuable things um, for me that, that I will, um, that I will take away from this. And I think that leads into the, uh, into the, the second part of your question for me, which is, um, that those interactions don't have to end. Um, those experiences don't have to end. And for me, I think that is the, that is the next step um, is for, for me is to continue those, those interactions. 
Okay, I'm 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 really up against it. So, <laughs> Rabbi Werber, real quick, if you have anything to add, if not, that's fine. And Pastor Matheson, Rabbi, I would Rabbi just Werber. say, um, conversations like this remind us we can't turn away because once it's a friend, you you don't have a choice but to help. Um, I would say moving forward, I'm trying to be quick, moving forward, um, I think we have to, as two communities, find ways to have fun and relax together and celebrate together and just be regular people together. But then we also have to find a way to get pretty comfortable with discomfort and have the conversations and look into ourselves uh, and find a way to make change in the world together. All right. Real quickly. I think these conversations are, are endemic of that we have more in common than we have in difference. Mm -hmm. And to highlight what we have in common and to realize that we, we do have much in common. One of the things we have in common as an African-American community, a Jewish community, we have, we have pain. And it does not need to be compared or, or competitive, but it, but it is there. So one of the next steps as I look at this, uh, picking up on what everybody else said, let's share a meal. Let's get in each other's, let's get in each, invite each other into their space. Preferably we can do that sooner than later, more so than, more so than virtually. But we get into each other's space, we get close to each other, we share space and uh, learn more about each other on a very, on a very personal eyeball to eyeball, heart to heart level. Thank you so much. I want to turn it over to my friend, Kathy Bear. She has a couple of questions for the panelists that she would like to share at this time. Okay, this question comes from Rebecca and Darlene, and it says, since the global rise of anti-Semitism and denial of the Holocaust and BDS, how would the pastors say they would engage, encourage, and support the Jewish community in Israel? So the question is to us? Yes. First quote, the first thing I would say, we need to lament with one another. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking, is, is getting that same space and and just sit in, in silence and sit in that shared experience. Okay, I think we'll take one more. And... Um, and, and maybe this is a, a longer one that I should ask. How would you compare the Black Lives Matter movement to the civil rights movement in the 60s? To anyone? I, I'll try and give my colleagues time to, to come up with a better answer than mine by just giving a quick answer. I think, I think one of the one of the, I don't know enough about the details of the civil rights movement um, of the 60s to truly compare it, uh, at least not academically. Uh, but I would, I think one of the, one of the things that we've watched be successful, I would actually pull in the, the pride movement in the LGBTQ community as an example is that, that organization and um, building collective power across uh, different communities has an impact and that impact can be long lasting. Uh, so we watched, we, we've watched uh, marriage equality um, get built over decades and, and have a broad base. I, you know, is Black Lives Matter that, I, I don't know that there's enough of, of a clear organization yet building that yet. I think there are a lot of people involved and, and lots of people show up and lots of people want it. I don't know yet. Um, how, what the organization looks like as an organization, getting us together with clear, uh, here's what we're going to do and here's our 10 year plan. Uh, and I think that we've seen that work in America um, for towards change. And I, and I think, again, not knowing, but I think in the, in the 60s, that's part of what King and others were doing. It was deliberate and it was long-term and it was action-based, but it was a plan. Uh, and, and they were looking at the long run uh, and the plan was not to solve it next week. It was to solve it for the next generation. I think if we can do that, think get, if we can get planning that way, we'll, we'll have hopefully long-term change. I think you're absolutely right in that regard. I would, the only thing I would add to that, um, aside from the organizational perspective that may be there or may not, the demographic is much broader today. 
it is much broader. You look, you just look out over the crowd and the the, the different ethnicities, the different, um, uh, yeah, the different ethnicities, the people from different countries. You look at that, and it is it is much broader, if you will, than it was um, than it was back in the sixties. But I agree with you about the organizational piece. Yeah, and I would even jump on and piggyback on that a bit. And I think, I think its strength is in how diverse it is. Um, because the civil rights, a lot of the organizing was around specific laws. It was around, you know, busing. It was around, you know, segregation. It was around very specific targeted laws where now the marching is against racism, um, which is which is a very different scenario um, when there's very specific uh, legislation that you're pushing for versus a, a, a protest against a whole system um, that in many ways is an ideology in and of itself. Um, it, it makes it a very more, it makes it a lot, a lot of different challenges in that. And it's gonna need that broad base of support. Yeah. Okay, hey, Rabbi, wherever I want, I, I don't wanna leave you out if you don't have anything. I was gonna say, it sounds like you're expecting me to say, I think it was well said. I think Black Lives Matter is the civil rights movement. Yeah. Um, mm. I mean, people's lives, what's, what's more civil rights than your lives? Mm. Um, yeah. And we can talk about what's the same and what's different, but it is the civil rights movement today. And mm. um, the repercussions are, are just as important. And, and, and on, on that point, I, I would say that reminds me of what somebody said uh, a few years ago, at a social justice gathering uh, in Columbus. Uh, they said, people often ask, uh, I wonder what I would have done if I was uh, an adult during the civil rights movement. And her response is, ask yourself what you're doing now and you'll know the answer to what you would have done. So I, I, th I think Rabbi Werb is right to say, uh, you know, this is, this is now and, and, uh, and for us to, to ask ourselves, where do I fit into this and how do I help it move forward? Um, given that it looks different and, and is different and, uh, and yet uh, it'll answer our question about what we would have done in generations prior uh, too. Man. Well, hey, that, that, that's going to, man, we're going to kind of put a bow on it right there. So I want to just thank each and every one of you for your time um, tonight and bringing your best self and bringing your truth and giving us the insights that you have. Thank you so much as panelists for just speaking um, and also speaking into one another, but also speaking into us as well. And I want to thank our listening audience that has been out there and the questions that you have presented that, man, cause us to dig a little bit deeper um, and also cause us to, man, to challenge ourselves to say, hey, what are we going to do now? What are our next steps? And some of those next steps were mentioned um, throughout this, this discussion today. Um, just want you to know as well, for all of our audience, there will be a survey mail emailed out right after the end of the program. And I hope you will take a few minutes to answer just a few questions about this program on this evening. We really appreciate your feedback so that we can continue to move forward together. And again, this is just the, the third installment of what's going to be continue to go on throughout the course of this month, which is Black History Month. So happy Black History Month to all of us that are out there. And so the next, next Thursday, February 18th, this is an interactive session where we get to hear from you about what our next steps will be. You will be placed in small breakout rooms where you will share your ideas. So, hey, you've been listening, you've been a part, you've been coming. Now we're going to give you the platform or the podium, if you will, to really share your thoughts and ideas about what, about what we can do moving forward. Um, and so that's gonna be great for us to do that. And so to continue to build on these relationships and to expand into Akron community, these discussions that we're having. So again, um, I am Coach Kemp, the Executive Director of Love Akron and how we try to end all of our shows. Um, if you don't do anything else, make sure that you love Akron. Again, thank you all so much. Have a great evening. Pastor Matheson, please go eat, brother. You've done a great job. You're I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you.